Hello and Happy New Year, or if you're watching this and it's not Happy New Year then well it doesn't make any sense, but it's 2016 now, just had Christmas and today we're going to talk about libraries. So we're going to talk about how to create static and dynamic libraries and how to link to external, typically dynamic libraries, although you can link to an external static library as well. So a library is a collection of functions, structures and other things program code that is bundled in such a way that it makes it easy to reuse it. So why you might create a library is if you've got a library for your math functions you might want to maintain that separately perhaps it hardly ever changes, you don't want to have to keep recompiling it every time you build your complete program that uses those functions so you maintain that in a separate library and only change that when you need to. So there's two types of library that you can create and use and they're useful for two different purposes. The first one is called a static library and so we had our own math library we shouldn't really call it math. What we're going to do in the example we're going to create a kind of wacky math library so say we had libwacky the static library would end in .a which stands for archive and .a files are managed by the tool ARR and what you'll notice is what you might notice is that AR was actually a precursor to the tool TAR so if you ever use TAR on Unix uh, which is for manipulating TAR archives then AR was the precursor to that and essentially an archive is just it's going to have some objects in there so maybe there's wacky.o and it will also have like a, a file that's invisible when you list the files but it will be what's called a symbol table which will contain a list of all the functions that are in all of your object files so an archive file which is a static library just contains a bunch of object files and it contains a symbol table which lists all of the functions that are in those object files now the purpose of a static library is to bundle together a bunch of functions and then you can link against an archive file in the same way that you link against an object file. So if your program uses the functions that are in this archive then you link against it and then they're included in your program. And they're included in the executable of your program. They're copied into the executable of your program. So that grows the size of your executable depending on how many of the functions you use. So this is a static library and it's called static because when you link against it those functions are bundled into your program which means that in theory you could copy your program from one Linux machine to another and it would, as long as it was the same architecture, it would just run, it wouldn't depend on any external libraries. So that's a, a static library and the reason you might do this is because there is like ostensibly some speed up but realistically that's probably neg neg negligible uh, the main reason is that it makes it a little bit more portable because you don't have to depend on the particular libraries that are on the system and <laughs> that that's mainly it essentially that you can bundle your program like that but in order to really understand that we need to look at what the other type of library is and that is called a shared library, or a dynamic library. So we might see something like libwacky.so. This is our, going to be our wacky math library. And essentially, in libwacky.so is going to be the object file, in a way. It's going to be in there. But the point of a shared or dynamic library is, is that it is not bundled into your application. So your application executable will not contain the functions in this library that you use. They are instead kind of linked into the executable in a way that they, the code is relocatable. So at runtime, when you run the executable, it looks for this file and then dynamically loads those functions into memory so that you can call those functions. So the advantage of this, and the reason it's called a shared library, is imagine if you wrote, had 100 programs on your computer that all used the same library. And this is really common, like there's, there's networking libraries or you know, JPEG libraries and things which are incredibly common, or zip libraries, really common. And you don't want to copy those functions into your executable for all of your 100 executables because your execut executables become bloated. And also what that means is if you want to 
if you update the library, it means you have to recompile all of the uh, programs that, it, that depend on that library. Whereas you can recompile the shared object, so the shared library, as long as none of the function prototypes have changed and the new program, uh, and when you run the programs again, it will load that library in. Typically though, people end up changing the function prototypes and have to recompile all of the programs anyway. But, <laughs> the advantage here is you've just got one copy of the library and everyone can dynamically load that at runtime. You can get into trouble with this because you can end up having lots of different versions of the shared library around and this is called like dependency hell or something like this where you're linking against a particular version and then when you update your programs you can end up forgetting that you're linking against a particular version and the program no longer works and stuff like that. But anyway, let's not get worried about that. Now, let's just look at this first library then which is creating a static library. So we're going to create a static library and we're going to link against it and show you the executable. Let's go and have a look at that. So we're going to create a static library, which means that we need some kind of library to use. And we're going to create a file then called wacky, wackymath.h. So this is going to be the header file for our library. And in there, we're going to have a single function called wacky add. And we're going to prefix these functions in here with the wacky. This is because the symbol names have to be unique when we link against them. Otherwise, the compiler will be confused. So this is called wacky underscore add. And it's going to take two integers a and b. And it's going to add them together. But that's our header file. So we're going to create another file called wackymath.c, which is actually going to contain the functions. So we're going to include wackymath.h, and we're going to have wacky add, int a, int b. And what we're going to do in wacky add, we're going to return a plus b, b plus, and we're going to use a function called rand, which returns a random integer. And we're going to modulo 10 so that we get a number between 0 and 9. And because we're using rand, we need to include something called sta standard lib.h, which is where rand is defined. So rand is only a pseudo random number, which means it generates a sequence of a, which numbers which look random, but they're in fact predictable if you know the seed. So that's going to be our function, wacky add. We're going to need a program as well which uses that. So we're going to create wacky.c, which is going to, we need standard io.h, we need to include wacky math.h, and then we're going to have a pretty simple program. We're actually going to call srand, so we need standard lib.h, to set the random seed, and we'll set the random seed to zero. And then we're going to call wacky, we're going to print out the result of wacky add 3, 4. And we're going to call wacky add within the numbers 3 and 4. And we're going to do that like four times and then return 0. Oh, yeah, I've done something wrong there. Yeah, we haven't terminated these lines. There we go. So that's going to be our program. So what we need to do, you know, we need to create a make file as, as well, uh, which I've already done here, but let me just remove that. So we're going to have a def default for Wacky. So Wacky is going to be our program. And Wacky is going to depend on an archive for, file called libwacky.a. So, and there's an automatic make file, make file rule which knows how to handle this. But, just to be explicit, we're going to compile wacky.c along with libwacky.a and we're going to create an output called wacky. So then we define the target for libwacky.a. And what we'll say is that libwacky.a depends on libwacky 
oh sorry, depends on wacky math dot o. And we know there's an automatic rule to build o files from a dot c file, so we don't have to bother about that target, but we do need to specify the actions for this. So in order to create libwacky dot a, we're going to use the tool ar and we are going to use rc and v switches r means create a new archive and then add these objects to the archive so it will create wacky math libwacky.a and it'll add wacky, wacky math.o to the archive c means to suppress the output saying that we're creating a new archive and v means be verbose which I guess contradict each other in a way, but let's do it anyway. And so um, what we'll do is we're going to create libwacky.a, so we're using the automatic variable, which refers to this name, and we're going to include all of the object files. So we're going to use that. Now this should actually work. So when we run make, we're going to try and build the tacket while the target wacky, the tacky wacky, the, the target wacky, which depends on libwacky.a. So we'll go down to build libwacky.a, build wacky math.o, and it knows how to build that. It'll just, uh, and you'll see, it will show you that when I type make. Once that's built, it will then run AR to create the archive for libwacky.a, which means that libwacky.a will exist. It then knows how to compile wacky and produce the output. So let's have a look if that will work. So here we are, the first line was creating the object file, wackymath.o. As I said, it knows how to do that. We've then created the archive loop, wacky.a, and, um, and we're including the object file, wackymath.o. Right. Then we've got, we're using Clang to create our output file. So let's have a look what we've got. So we've now got wacky, and we've got libwacky.a. If we run wacky, you can see that we're adding 3 and 4 and we're adding a random number between 0 and 9 to that number, to that result. So 7 plus 0 or 9. And whenever we run it, it's we get the same output sequence because, as I said, it's only pseudo-random and it depends on the seed. If we change the seed, compile it again. Oh, okay, fair enough. So nothing's happened because we've not said that wacky depends on wacky.c. Now we haven't recompiled libwacky, you see, so because we didn't need to. You can see that the sequence now is different because we changed the random seed. So we've there we've created a static library called libwacky.a from our wacky math um, files, and then we're linking against it here to create our output file. So let's just have a quick look at what's in these files. So using the AR tool, we can also list the files that are in a um, an archive. And if we don't use the verbose switch, we just get the file. So we can see that that's all that's in the archive, just that object file. So it's quite straightforward. And interestingly, we can also use another tool called NM, which lists the symbols, the symbols in an archive file. Because there is another... There is actually another file inside this archive, which is a, a special file which contains a symbol table, which we can't see. But if we use nm, we can see that nm contains one object which has the following symbols in it, or it has the following functions in it. It has the symbol rand, because if you remember, we did actually use rand in our wacky add function, and this u means that it's undefined, whereas this t means that it's defined and it's global, and there's a symbol called wacky add. So we can actually see what functions are defined by a in by the objects in a library like that using the tool nm. And of course you can read the man pages for nm and for ar. What we can also do is list the symbols in wacky in our actual program. And you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff that is kind of that you probably didn't know was in there and you can read all about this stuff and it's quite complicated the structure of the program. But what you'll also see is that there's a function called main, which is a global function, so it's defined, and it's, it's part of the symbol table of our executable wacky, and you'll see that wacky add is also now in the executable. So when we, when we link our executable, when we, when we build it, 
wacky add is actually copied into the executable wacky and it's part of its symbol table so that's the meaning of static it is statically built into the um, the executable and it's available in that executable it doesn't have to be linked at runtime or anything like that okay so that's how you create a static library and of course if we wanted to I'll just show you one extra thing um, we don't have to explicitly link to the file, the archive file. We could use the dash L and then type wacky and and then if we do this, I need to change the file, just let me change the seed. Okay. It, we'll, we've got this error, cannot find L wacky. And that's because it, the compiler doesn't know where to find it. So I need to add one extra thing here. If I do this other flag, this capital L means look in these directories for the libraries. So there we go. So we, I said look in the current directory for the library and we're linking against wacky and it knows to prefix um, wacky with lib. So it will actually look for lib wacky and it will look for a .a or a .so file. In this case, it's found a .a file and it knows how to link. So typically when you're linking, especially against shared files that are somewhere else on the system, maybe they're in user local lib, you'll use these L switches to define directories to look in, and then you'll just use L and then the name of the library. So if we were to look in user lib, you'll see there's lots of files here like libm.so, libm.a, um, lib libkvm.a. So th this is a static library for kvm system and or a static library for the math system so we can link to those just by using the dash l prefix but as you can see all these dot a files and dot so files they just exist on the system and so we just link to them the same way we exactly as we've done here like in our make file so that's it that's how you create a static library and link to it so not that difficult really is it and you can of course link to any of the static libraries that are available on your system and compile them into your program and what we've also seen is though that a static library can depend in the, if we list the uh, symbols in a static library there may be undefined symbols so we might even though we're statically linking all of our libraries we still might have those libraries themselves might depend on some dynamic library or in which case they'd still be loading those at runtime, right? Now, so we looked at static libraries and now let's look at the dynamic library. So let's just look at how to create a dynamic library and then link to that. So for our dynamic library, we're not actually gonna change anything. So we're still gonna, if you remember the program, we've got our wacky math, which just adds the two numbers together and calls rand. We're only going to change actually the make file to create a dynamic library and then link to that instead. So let me open the make file. Now, in order to make things a bit clearer, let's create two targets. We're going to have wacky static and wacky dynamic. So we're going to create two programs. So we'll change this target to wacky static. Wacky static is still going to depend on libwacky.a and wacky.c but we are not going to use this notation. So as I said, if you use this dash L, it will look for a library called libwacky um, dot so or libwacky dot a, but it will do it in that order. So it will look for libwacky dot so first. So this will actually always compile, always link to the, the dynamic library if it exists. So we're just gonna explicitly create a static library um, by that will use the automatic variable to refer to these and our output is going to be wacky static and before if I, before that let me just comment out wacky dynamics we, we don't want to we haven't written the target for that yet now what we get here if we try and do this I just want to illustrate a point here we've got undefined reference to wacky add when we're trying to compile, compile this and we didn't get that before now the reason that we've got this is because clang the order in which we supply the arguments to clang matters 
All we're going to say at this moment is that the libraries have to come after the C files. And the order does matter, and sometimes it becomes a problem. But typically, if you just put the library after the C file, so I'm going to do that here, then it will work. Uh, you can read up all about how the linker works and how it resolves the order of um, objects in the past files, but sometimes it will matter. So you will have problems like that where you're you're looking you're like, well, I'm providing the object file, I'm providing the library. What does it mean in the find reference? And pretty much that will always, unless you unless the object really isn't in the library, it will always be something to do with the order that you provided the libraries. So if we've we've just now changed it so that the library is now the last thing, and type make, and we don't get a problem. And let's just check then that our wacky static program runs fine. So we've now got our static program fine, and we've pointed out that the order in which you provide the the library matters. Yeah, I, it has to come last because those the linking step is last, and these things are resolved in a certain order. Let's create then a new target called wacky dynamic. And we're still going to take wacky.c as an input. We're going to say that we depend on libwacky.so, the shared objects. Typically, we wouldn't do this if it was like an external library because we wouldn't be building it, but we are building it in this case. And what we're going to do is we are going to, we're going to use wacky.c. And we're going to use the notation that we're looking for a library in the current directory. And the library is called wacky. And our output is going to be wacky dynamic. So we need a target to build libwacky.so. It depends on wacky math.o as well. And what we need to do is we say we're creating a shared library and the shared library is called libwacky.so and it depends on wacky math dot o or it contains wacky math dot o so let us we're just going to compile our wacky dynamic target just to avoid confusion now we're going to get an error and i've done this deliberately so let's have a look what the error is. So we try and create the shared object, depending on wacky math.o. And what it says is relocation our x64, x86 64 PC32 against this object cannot be used when making a shared object. Recompile with fpick. Now what this means is that the code is not relocatable. So when we create a shared object file, all of the code in there, all of the functions need to be called what's relocatable. This means that they can be placed anywhere in memory. This is because the object file, the shared library, might be loaded in anywhere in memory at runtime. So in this case, we just do what it said. We need to create wacky math.o as a relocatable object. And we were before this was compiled automatically using make files one of the automatic rules, so we need to explicitly create a rule to make sure that this is done correctly. So our wacky math.o, which depends on wacky math.c and wacky math.h, we're going to compile this using this, and we're creating an object file, so we use the dash c, and we our input is wacky math.c, and our output is called wacky math.o, which is our target. So let me just remove wacky math.o and then let's run that again. So now we create this wacky math.o object using the fpick um, flag, which means to make it relocatable code. Now we can create the shared library, libwacky.so, using that object. And finally, we can then link, compile our program, link against libwacky.so. And this will find the, the libwacky.so in the current directory and create the object file wacky dynamic. Right, so let's just try and run that. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> wacky dynamic. Now, what we get is this error shared object libwacky.so not found. This is because when you execute a program, 
it looks in certain locations for these .so files. And if you read something called ldconfig, this is how the shared library cache or the, share, the system-wide shared library cache is created. So ldconfig is a very powerful tool. So you can use ldconfig to add your library to the system library ca cache, and then it will find it. It's basically a bunch of directories that it searches. But there's another way to do it. What we can do is we can set the environment variable ld library path, and we can equals to to the current directory or whatever directory we want and then at runtime the linker the dynamic linker will look in the current directory for libwacky so now if we, we run wacky dynamic it works so we've observed a couple of things here to get our dynamic library to work we had to use fpick to make the object file relocatable in order to compile a dynamic library a shared library um, with that object file. Then at we had to use this um, capital L to say look in the local current directory for our so file. We observe that the so file is always linked first, so we can only use this to link against an A file if that A file is the only thing. If there's a so file that will always link. There is a dot shared dash shared flag. Um, that you can pass to Clang, but that will try and create link every library as static rather than just the library you want. There are ways around around that and to, to try and make it um, link to only one library statically and the rest dynamically, but it's quite complicated to do and it's a bit of a mouthful. And finally, we had to make sure that when we, at runtime, our program knows where to find the, the shared library and we can use a library path or we can use ldconfig and go and look up ldconfig of how to do that. On FreeBSD it's particularly easy to rebuild ldconfig. On other systems you can completely mess up your system um, because there's a, by default I think it <laughs> it just overwrites the library cache with the directory we provide on some other systems and which means that none of your programs will run after that and you have to rebuild the whole cache which can be quite difficult if you can't run any programs. Anyway so that's how you build a shared library and how you link against it. So let me just build Wacky Static as well. I'll just check that that's built. And what you'll note here is that we can build Wacky Static and we can we can build libwacky.a against the .o file even though we compiled the .o file with fpick. Like it doesn't matter that that's relocatable. We can still build a static file. And Wacky Static is going to produce the same output as wacky dynamic but let's check we use nm and we'll look at wacky static and we can see that wacky add function is global so it's part of the executable wacky static whereas if we look at wacky dynamic we can see that wacky add is undefined it's an external library which is part of um, libwacky dot so so if we look at libwacky.so, you can see the wacky add is global, obviously it's part of that shared library, and the same as libwacky.a, but there's some slight differences. So there you go, that is how you create a shared library and link to it. All right, we've seen both how to create static and dynamic libraries and how to link to them. And so what we'll do now is let's link to a library that we haven't created. So we're gonna to link to some existing library on our system because that's perhaps a more common use case just using someone else's library that they've written. So look at that. So let's go and link to an external library. What we're going to do is we're going to create an SDL program. So SDL is called Simple Direct Media Layer and it's a library for um, making games and things like that, doing multimedia stuff so you can draw to the screen and so on. It says it here is used by some Valve programs. So it's a pretty cool library. And it's already installed on my system. On your system you might have to install the dev package but you can look at that. So if you're on Linux you might do apt cache search um, uh, SDL pipe grep dev and see what the dev package is. 
uh, and otherwise install the library because you need the header files and you need the library in order to link to it. So let's go ahead. Now what I've got here is a very very simple program. I just copied this example here. So there's the credit for that. And of course in this program, and we've called it sdlexample.c. So the first thing we do is include the header, stl header. And you'll quite often see this, that the header file is actually in a subdirectory. And that's okay. So if we're, it will search for stl.h within a subdirectory stl within the include search path, which we're going to look at in a second. So it's a very simple program. It we create two STL surfaces, a bitmap and a screen. Originally they're null. These are pointers to those surface structures. We initialize STL using this function. Then we set the video mode to 640 by 480 pixels, a depth of 32 bits, and it's a surface type. We then load this bitmap. This is in Windows bitmap for, format, and I've put this in the directory, this mushroom picture. And we then uh, blit the surface, the bitmap to the screen. So we're writing, we're drawing the bit, bitmap onto the screen. So our mushroom picture then gets drawn onto the screen. Then we update the screen, so we call SDL flip. And this is like a lot in a lot of graphics programming. What typically happens is they use what's called double buffering. So you write off screen and then you flip that onto the screen so you never write directly to the screen that's quite common so that's what's happening there we're just drawing essentially the screen to the actual screen so we can see what we've written we then wait two seconds so that we don't just immediately exit so we can actually see the picture and then we free up the bitmap service and quit so it's a quite a simple program so how do we compile this well let's open up our make file and what we're going to do is we're going to use the same make file we're going to create another target called sdl example and our SDL example is going to be, depend on sdlexample.c and we need to compile it, obviously. So we're going to have the inputs. Now we need to specify the library and the library is dash L SDL. So it's capital SDL and you need to know what that is. And if I do a locate sdl.so you'll see that that's what it is. Um, you, you, can, you can go and look for it if you don't know the name, and you can it'll usually just be the name either in capitals for a library or in non-capitals, and you'll be able to find what it's called. So it's libstl.so. We, we know that it's in this directory, so we need to also say that we want to look for it in user local lib. So we need to say where the library is that we're linking to. And there's something else as well. Because in SDL example, we, well, I'll show you, I'll show you. So that's our compilation for SD, SDL example. And then let me just um, try and make that target to show you. So we get an error which says we cannot find the header file. So here is another flag that you can pass to a command, command um, invocation of your compiler which is a dash i, which specify include file locations. And I know that that's actually in, so sdl.h, if I have a look for it, is actually in user local include. So we need that directory, so we can put dash i user local include, and now the compiler will look there for the header file, and we've actually compiled our output correctly. So we found the header file, we were able to include that compiler program, we were able to find the library and by specifying the library uh, postfix, so the name of the library without the lib and the directory where to find that library. And let's just run that and see if it's worked. There you go, there's the mushroom which displayed for two seconds. So that's an example of how you could link to an external library. So it's not really that difficult. You just have to provide the library name, where to find the library, and where to find the include files. So whenever you look at a very complicated compilation line, like where there's some big program being compiled, it'll just be a ton of these. So a ton of these um, L statements, a ton of these I statements, and a load of these statements, or statements, I don't know, clauses or something. Um, basically specifying all the libraries that need to be linked to and that 
so you hopefully now you won't be intimidated when you see like big compilation things. One thing I will point out is a lot of the time when there's a library like SDL installed on your system, these days quite often there'll be a tool as well called um, dash config after the name. So like SDL dash config or GTK dash config. And a lot of libraries do this these days. And this tool actually helps you to provide um, this information. So if I just type SDL config, it'll tell us what we can actually ask for. And we can ask for the libs or the C flags or the static libs. So let's have a look what happens. Let me just cl clear it. If we ask, sorry, if we ask for the libs, then we actually get the commands that we need to pass in. These are a little bit more involved. They've kind of provided some extra information here. And um, they're also linking to the threading library as well, which we didn't get a complaint when we did that. So Clang was able to sort of sort that out. But what this is saying is that really we should include that pthread um, information ideally as well like we should be linking to that to that library um, just let me remove that put this in the clean see you'll see I've created a clean target yep so our STL example now has the pthread part but going back to STL config so if we ask for the C flags it tells us that there's, that's where we find there's an include path, or that might be the include path. So it doesn't necessarily know whether the sdl.h is in a subdirectory. Or sometimes you might need both. So SDL config or the config program for a particular library gives you the kind of the full set of um, flags that you should use when compiling it. So here there's a couple of defines as well, which we haven't looked at yet, but these can essentially switch on and off um, macros and and well switch on and off define blocks within your code and that's what they've done here great well that's it uh, we've shown shown you how to create static and dynamic libraries how to create your own ones and how to link to them and also how to link to existing static and dynamic libraries that's all there is to know really about libraries in order to use them, I mean, there's a hell of a lot of detail about how archive files are created, how the structure of shared object files and things like that, but it's not necessary to know that information to use it. Hopefully now you can go and use any library that's out there and start building the programs you want to build. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.